Today, I'm going to speak out of my own expertise and uh, scope. But uh, as you all know, I like to play around and try to learn as much as I can wherever I go. So please bear with me because we do have some distinguished audience sitting, knowing so much more about the subject than I do, of course. So I would clearly hope to hear comments from uh, everyone in this audience. What I'm trying to do today is actually to try to study the questions on the so-called air pollutants, the PM 2.5, and uh, the related issue of uh, ground ozone, which is sort of bad for your lungs. So we need to understand how all this variable changes and what are the sources of these uh, pollutions and how they relate to the natural environment. Again, I really speak here on my own behalf. It doesn't represent DDP nor anyone else, including my family, it's only myself. I'm glad that uh, Jane gave that wonderful introduction. We do live in this universe or crazy world of uh, disease with half-truth, and which is exactly the, the point of my talk, is just trying to point you to all this half-truth that doesn't amount to too much. Because oftentimes we are, very, we are being posed with this very simple mathematical equation. Probably Al Gore can solve this one. Half truth plus half truth, I guess, it must be equal to one truth. <laughs> Unfortunately, everybody knows what the answer is, right? <clears throat> it doesn't amount to anything much. I would like to call it a lie because it is a lie when you really constantly swim in this poo and craziness of half truth that is just really, really suffocating in terms of uh, science especially, for myself as a scientist. This is very intolerable. And of course, we are supposed to shut up about these things, so I don't think so. <laughs> I'm going to start with the bottom line, basically, by borrowing this wisdom from Professor Richard Wilson. He's, uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's a professor of physics at Harvard University. I just got reminded because recently he wrote to me after I'm being attacked by all these people, so uh, to give words of encouragement. But I think some of the thoughts that he put into in terms of risk and how EPA is assessing risk, it's very, very valuable for all of us to take home with. The key statement that he made, I think you can read it for yourself, is to point to this fundamental basic problem, which I think Ed Calabrese and uh, Matt Briggs and a bunch of you will clarify a lot more about the EPA stuff. That's about as much as I would say a little bit about EPA, but I'll show a bit more about what's wrong with EPA these days. But their risk analysis is essentially just overly conservative in that sense. Because what it requires for you to consider to be harmful or dangerous will be something of what they call premature death at a level of a risk level of one to one million over a lifetime. And in short term basis, one over 10 million. As you can tell from Professor Wilson's word, I mean, a single dose of two cigarettes in a lifetime would already satisfy this criterion. By the way, with this criterion, you might as well ban car. All of you know that the lifetime risk for any car accident is on the order of 1%, to, uh, 1 let's say. That's about 10,000 times, right, of what the risk is, uh, this arbitrary risk level of uh, EPA. So it really is a fundamental problem that I hope our society will beginning to learn to accept how risk, I mean, how life is full of risk, and then we just have to really, really work out the, 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 what, our choice, actually, to, to how we want to live. Not the way that EPA is dictating on everyone, especially on the industry and all these different unnecessary regulations. If you allow me, because uh, I guess this is a second or third speech that I get to speak after I'm being attacked by front page of New York Times in February 23rd of uh, Sunday New York Times. Of course, I, I couldn't make myself to buy a copy of New York Times, so I had to borrow from Greenpeace. <clears throat> By the way, they, those are the people that actually somehow very strangely actively come after me. I, I don't know why. Maybe I'm just looking too good for them. To start that, I guess we have to see how this whole issue is uh, turning into a very big circus, in my opinion, with uh, a lot of uh, elephants and uh, jungles and all kinds of stuff. Let's start from Reverend L. Shapton. When it comes to denying the human impact of global warming, Republicans have it down to a science. If climate change is a problem and 
Do you believe it is or not? Do you believe I'm, I'm not a scientist. I don't know the science behind climate change. Well, listen, I'm not going to I'm not qualified to debate the science over climate change. What is your take on global warming or climate change? No, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a scientist. It's their favorite line. And when they do actually talk about scientists, they usually point to people like Dr. Willie Soon. He's the darling of the right-wing climate denier caucus. He says greenhouse gases just aren't that bad for you. Senator Inhofe has repeatedly cited his work over the years. The same Senator Inhofe who once said this about climate change. The, the fact that all this is happening is due to man-made gases. I really believe it's the greatest hoax ever perpetrated in the American people. The greatest hoax ever perpetrated. And to back him up, he pointed to people like Dr. Sue. These are scientists that cannot be challenged. I'm not too sure about that, Senator. Because the New York Times reports Dr. Soon has accepted $1.2 million in funding from the fossil fuel industry, which he hasn't disclosed in most of his scientific papers. Interesting. A guy pushing back on climate change debate while getting paid by oil and gas companies. Well, I'm not a scientist, but I can sure spot a potential conflict of interest when I see one. So nice try. But don't even try to deny this one, because we got you. Yeah. Thank you, Reverend L. James Brown. Well, this is what you get, right? I mean, you do science and you work as hard as you can and you turn into a McDonald person. There are all kinds of these sort of childish little things that they've been putting around, like including me distorting these images using my gravitational force. I would rather see an image like this, right, which is a pure gravitational lensing predicted by general relativity. It's a lot more fun. And uh, you know they are actively coming after me. It's kind of funny, but I do wanted to point out a few of this uh, strange stuff. This is one of them forecast the fact, trying to get Smithsonian to fire me, which of course they are still trying. Uh, the facts that I wanted to point out in this graph is that uh, this, even the statistics, you could not trust them because as soon as these things were up, no more than 12 hours, you know, when we first saw it, it was about 20, 23,000. And then, you know, all these times, they were just added nine people, actually. And they were actually boosted up the number from, from baseline of 23,000. I don't know how they get 23,000 so quick. And then if you see as time progress, the Smithsonian are happily working with forecast effects. So they were giving them all kinds of stuff about really soon. And then uh, the number really didn't climb up that much. And then by... July, you can see they even changed the web page and uh, they still are not getting that many people to try to get me fired. And then you know the more famous group is moveon.org. Actually, they're getting a lot less uh, people. Probably they are more honest in their statistics. They got 8,000 people. And then July 23, they barely increased 10 people more or something like that. So it's, it's telling you that these people are just trying to get more funding for themselves rather than seriously interested in anything else. <coughs> So if you really want to attack me, I say, pardon my French, right? Je suis really soon. They actually, this phrase didn't come out by me, obviously. It came out by these two persons that appear on the blog by, of WhatsApp with that. So they are very cleverly say this word, which I fully agree. In that sense, I wanted to, I guess, show you a list of uh, my collaborator. Started with Sally Balunas, Pius O.K.K., Art Robinson, Lord Christopher Moncton, Scott Armstrong, Bing Huang, Wester Velasco, Peter Frick, Sokolov, Postman Deer, Kushik Duta, Sherwood Itso, Bob Carter, Willis, so many of them. Professor Kirill Kondratyev, Professor Joseph Kunz, Lucy Hancock, Matt Briggs, you know, all of them. If you attack me, you attack all of them, including all of you, yes? It's just a terrible thing that they think they can do to try to silence people to tell the truth about science. This is the kind of thing that shall not stand. Well, I'm not supposed to put this up. Maybe he can sue me on that one. <clears throat> it bothers me a lot, actually, because lately I even try to say that this sort of thing needs to be explained better to the public because the public doesn't seem to understand how science works in a basic sense. Uh, is it really about funding that matters? In science? I hope most of you will answer that no, right? I mean, the best example I can come up with is actually Professor Stan Prusner, 
For those of you who may not know him, he got the sole Nobel Prize winner for 1997 in medicine for the discovery of the causes, basically, of, of mad cow disease or things like that, of degenerative disease in our brain, by, I guess, the discovery of this infectious protein called prions. I mean, if you want to know the background of this, this, uh, this, this research, I think we go no further than giving a bit of credit to Professor Frederick Seitz. His, his name is often mentioned in this, is this conference because he's one of the people who help us to, to spread the petition project by, by lending his name, by, by circulating the, the petition around. But what Professor Seitz for, did for uh, Professor Stan Prusiner is rather amazing, actually. He was about to be fired, no more funding, no more anything to do his research because no, nobody believed in his ideas. And Professor Asai just simply pulled him aside and said how much money you need. And gave him the funding, the necessary funding to, to do his experiment properly by having enough rats and all that, and so that he was able to do this major discovery. But the funding came from R.J. Reynolds. What's wrong with the money from R.J. Reynolds? I don't know, actually. This is why I think the quote from Professor Fred Sai is very useful to know. As long as it's green, I mean, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a priest. All I'm interested in the scientific truth. And there's nothing more to it, nothing less to it. Please, stop it. So if you want to understand the contribution of those money to, this is a statement from Professor Stan Prusiner himself, with that money from R.J. Reynolds, helped by basically Professor Fred Seid, which of course endlessly being prosecuted as a prostitute of science or something like that, which is really disgusting to even hear. And this is what the work, the money can help to help him do the experiment to speed up the discovery so that instead of waiting 80 years, you can do it in one year. And why not we try it at least? Because there's no guarantee in science in anything. This experiment, by all means, could fail, by the way, right? But it is the process in which that we're doing it. And I don't think money is corrupting this process, isn't it? So I'm very sorry for those who keep insisting. And it bothers me very, very, very much that they keep thinking that money will be the bottom line for most of them. In fact, it's, as you can see, it's mostly a projection of their own reasoning. I'm one of those who is very lucky to be able to attend uh, Professor Fred Seid's 90th birthday. So I was very happy at least to, to have a little association with him. The middle person is actually Professor Bob Jastro, who was also spoke here once, I think, in DDP. So I'm very happy to have some affiliation or, or learn, learn from the masters uh, from time to time. Now, I, back to my subject of uh, air pollution. As you can see from New York Times, I mean, uh, Beijing is supposed to have a lot of people dropping dead now, right? Because the, supposedly the PM level is so high now that, you know, it's reaching a number. Supposedly, if you go from, the, the, the level has reached sometimes 755. That is actually measured in something like microgram per, per unit volume, which is meter cube, right? And the typical number in our air today is maybe no more than 10 to 20. So 755 seems to be very, very, very high. But what to do about this, right? The question is what to do about it. Is this a matter of, of, uh, of society not willing to, to, I guess, cut down their industrial activities for progress and, and things like that? Or is it really related to anything else that is other human factors like corruption of the official, Chinese official, for example? So you can see endlessly pages like this. These are pictures taken from Beijing. But then one thing they don't remind you is, of course, these people don't live in those atmospheres day in, day out, right? I mean, the example to show you is that from a level of, let's say, measure in the same units, on the right, on your right, will be, let's say, at the level of 50, and then 176 on the, on the left-hand side. It shows you that just within three days, you are dealing with basically a meteorological phenomenon, right? In some sense. And if you talk about surface ozone, it's even more interesting in that sense. So this is just a picture of how the, the, the different level of uh, PM 2.5 is being measured in uh, Beijing, the city of Beijing, and showing you the, the differences in all the season, but the main high level is all related to winter season, right? And you can see daytime, you have a lot less uh, high level than, than during nighttime. Just to give you a background on, on how this behavior of this, uh, this air pollutants. And then this is more like a, a, a a random data sets I mean, from uh, you know, quite a long series of record from 98 to present, essentially showing you the values are all over the place. I mean, we would invite statisticians like Matt Briggs and some of you to, 
to try to see if you can see any trend to this or, or to consider this to be a deterministic uh, results of, of, of industrial activities and so on. And you can see now this, this issue is not only limited to Beijing, it's all over the world now essentially. Here is a picture showing some place in, 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 let's say, New Delhi in India. And this is a picture from India and then of course during the clear time, it's as clear as anything else. It's all really, really depends on the timing and the meteorological condition. And these are plots showing you some of the data, and, and indeed that Delhi air sometimes now is more polluted than Beijing. So it's, it's, it's a growing problem in some sense. And in Delhi, you can see on the bad days, this is what it looks like. It's indeed looking very bad. In Tehran, you see a picture like that. In San Diego, Chile, it's all over the place. But now, ultimately, we wanted to understand also in relation to US, of course. In US, I did pose the question, how clean is clean? I'm quite sure that we are very clean now in that sense. This is why the EPA criteria, I mean, is coined the term designer disease syndrome by Dr. Charles Baddick. He also spoke here before. I'm boring his, his chart here. Indeed, that even for PM2.5, according to medical research, there is no plausible pathophysiological mechanism that can explain this, this relation of, let's say, PM2.5 with asthma, for example. No standardized definition. It's just about the size, 2.5 micron, micrometers. And, uh, well, chemical composition is not standardized, so, you know, it doesn't matter if it's ammonium or, or stuff like that. So you really need to know a lot better than, than to try to consider just PM2.5 will cause all the problem. But the main problem, as we will show some of the data, is that the claim of this toxic effect or the bad effects is all at a relative risk level of roughly 1 to 1.2. In, in scientific terms, that really means that you haven't detected anything, there's just no effects, essentially. The, the legal standard is that to be able to reach a legal standard of, of having some effects will be you need about 2.0 of relative risk, risk ratio. So what, what, what we are dealing with is indeed a lot of politics uh, with no actually scientific evidence to, to, to even support the case. As you can see, there are a lot more complication than just talking about small particles, right? You, you have airs, you have dust, you have soot, you have particles, you have liquid droplets and all kinds. And if you really, I mean, what EPA is saying is that essentially if you have a particles of this, and which as you can see, then this, this particle is really just all bad, right? It's going to cause all kinds of problem, which is not truly supported. And, 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 and the idea that it's all about size is really interesting. By the way, the, the, one of the experts, Professor Bob Phelan, is sitting in the audience. I mean, they are now beginning to design another, instead of PM2.5, they are going down to PM0.1, which is basically 10 to 100 nanometer particle size now. They're beginning to start doing that sort of monitoring. You can see the amount of uh, 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 paperwork is going to come very soon. But the, the stuff that I'm not too concerned about, the, the actually PM0.1 is basically that if you look at the numbers, they're all ranging in the units of, let's say, microgram per cubic meter, it's no more than four, actually, anything from zero to four. So it's not a very uh, large source of, uh, uh, of uh, pollutant in that sense. Here is now a distribution of total PM2.5 concentration spread all over the world, including dust and sea salt, and then this is an attempt to try to remove some of it. You can see that in, in area, desert area like Saudi Arabia and and many other places, you can see that most of it is contributed by dust, right? By dust and, and, and all the uh, uh, desert sands and stuff like that. And this is an example in Cairo, Egypt. I mean, during one of those sandstorms, you will get something like that. I mean, is it really a, a pollution of the kind that uh, you wish to control the desert uh, sand? Or what, what are you trying to do here? In Lagos, Nigeria, you know, near the, you also can have effects like this. But the main effects, the, the main bottom line is that indeed that in many regions, especially the USA, you can see, this is the plot of the difference of the concentration of PM2.5 from 2012 minus the, the one in 1998. So by 2012, you can see that there are still obviously places in the world like India, China, it's still basically in the red, which means they have an increasing concentration of PM2.5 concentration. Uh, but in large area of of places like US, you can see we are actually are under decreasing trend, right? And then, of course, EPA is trying to issue ever stringent uh, health criteria for, for PM2.5. These are examples of, of places, three places, I guess, outside US 
is going up, and then the one that is shown is actually is in uh, is in Detroit. It's actually going down a bit over this time period. <clears throat> in in Saudi Arabia, you clearly are dealing with desert areas, so you can see a lot of this stuff in Mongolia. No doubt about it. It's related to that. Plus, of course, a bit of this uh, industrial uh, issues, but. This is what EPA is claiming for health effect for PM 2.5, right? Any inhalation of this thing can cause death. I mean, the death from this occurs within hours, according to them. It's called sudden death. And you can see the amount of exaggeration by the quote from uh, the former administrator of EPA, Lisa Jackson. He said that if, we, if she could, we could reduce the particulate matter to healthy level, it would be the same impact as finding a cure for cancer in our country. This is a very serious exaggeration. <clears throat> of the kind of problem and non-problem we have. So you have, of course, the political process of trying to quantify all of this so-called premature death. I mean, the particulate matters sort of uh, issue is considered ranked very high in terms of the, the premature death. Uh, in China, you can see that clearly it's considered to be one of the top one next to tobacco smoking and uh, high blood pressure. But then, I hope you all realize by now that these are all just standard statistical tricks and, uh, and pretty much a nonsense in my opinion because according to a lot of uh, good doctors like yourself, real doctors really don't see any premature death. Where are all the dead bodies that these people are claiming, right? Simply because we really don't have the, the actual physiological connection to, to show the connection between those uh, pollution and the death, actually. And now I give you some... Uh, line of statistics, the statistics of uh, what is available in U.S. in terms of asthma rate versus the air pollutant uh, level. We have measurement like ozone and SO2 and then PM10 uh, uh, and PM2.5. Uh, basically all decreasing over time, right? And then you have this contradiction of the asthma rate depending on how you define your definition, either by the the, the red cross or the blue cross, you can see they're all increasing over time. And then, because this data is 2009, so I updated a little bit more. You can see this going down a little bit. I hope that uh, EPA is not saying that uh, because we reduce CO2, then it's helping us uh, getting less asthma rate. I hope, so. I hope not. I hope they don't dare to do, even do that. But anyway, you have this obvious contradiction, right? As the air is getting cleaner, there's more and more people suffering from asthma. So I don't think that this, this raw data could, could have any <coughs> reasonable interpretation from, from their viewpoint that uh, it has to do with the uh, air pollutants uh, level uh, causing the problem. Here is now the bottom line, actually, in the sense. The basis in which EPA wanted to make you know, this health, public health uh, criteria problem is basically based on this so-called the Harvard 6 CD study. It's basically from data like this plotting the PM 2.5 level versus the, the relative risk level. As I already hint to you that the level is basically no more than 1.2. They are going from anywhere from one, which is essentially saying that to, for this sample, they basically couldn't detect any effects of the, the, the risk of uh, PM 2.5, okay? And this is exactly the problem that we're dealing with here. And worse yet, worse yet, all these data that EPAs claim to support their own study it's actually was not, I mean, they didn't even refuse to, to release those data for people to check, or uh, independent checking. So this is why the representative Lamar Smith of Texas uh, introduced this new bill on uh, Secret Science uh, Reform Acts of 2015. This is another clip that is very revealing when uh, uh, Senator, uh, this congressman is challenging uh, Gina McCarthy, the current EPA administrator. Administrator McCarthy, my first question, and this will not surprise you, goes to the Secret Science Reform Act that I introduced that passed the House and that has passed a, uh, uh, the relevant committee in the Senate. Uh, President Obama's own science advisor, John Holdren, testified before the committee and said, absolutely, the data on which regulatory decisions and other decisions are based should be made available to the committee and should be made public. Why don't you agree with the President's science advisor and why don't you agree that this data that you use to justify these regulations uh, should be made public? As you know, the bill doesn't take a position on any regulation. We're not making a judgment call. We're just saying the American people and other scientists deserve to see this data. I'm hoping you've changed your mind and if so, uh, would welcome that comment. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, let me first say that, that we, EPA totally supports both transparency as well as a strong peer-reviewed independent science process. But the bill, I'm afraid, I don't think will get us there. We've had conversations about this before, Mr. Chairman. The way in which our science works is for scientists to to develop But, but why uh, not science. make this information public? Why not the, make it publicly available? The information that you're asking us to reveal is revealing publicly okay, now identifiable you, right, information. Right, now you and I both know, and we've talked about this many times, that information can be redacted, and I agree that it should be redacted, so why can't you release the information after it's been redacted? I think the fundamental difference of opinion we have, sir, is I don't, I don't actually need the raw data in order to develop science. That's not how it's done understand but why don't you give us the data that you have and why can't you get that data surely you have the data that you base the regulations upon well EPA has the authority and the need to actually get information that we have right. provided to you but you're saying you contradictory things you're saying you can't give us information because it's personal and then you're saying you don't have the information which is it well, when, when we receive the information, we're not allowed to release it, and there is much information that we are not, right. that we do not have the authority you've to gather. You've got the President's science advisor saying, our ability to do you've the got science. the President's science advisor saying you should make it public. I'm willing to say we'll be happy to redact all the personal information. There is no good reason why other scientists can't review it. There's no good reason why I don't think that the American people shouldn't see it either. We are absolutely in line with the science advisor. The science advisor, however, isn't indicating that every study that EPA looks at to determine to have a body of I'm science I'm not saying every decision. study. I'm just saying the studies and the data that you relied upon to try to justify but That is a body of data that we did not generate yeah. that is generated in science and peer review. I, I wish the EPA would follow, you know, the ranking member said you have nothing to hide. And yet, it looks to me like you're hiding a lot from the American people, and maybe we just Mr. have Chairman, to disagree on that. we're just protecting people's privacy. And again, there's and ways to do that, and every other agency does it except for the EPA. You I, can redact the information. If we're not going to agree, I regret that, but I think it okay. makes the EPA look bad. I do apologize for torturing you through this, but it is a very revealing one if you follow this whole thing. Essentially, what she says is that we don't need to justify, right, our regulation with any data, and the data shall not be public. We will only release anything that we wish to show you. That's about it. You just have to take it. In any case, this is exactly what uh, the kind of whistling that uh, EPA has been able to pull. I mean, in terms of the effects of PM 2.5, uh, Matt, probably, please don't, don't, don't knock your head on the, on the wall. PM 2.5 concentration above 13 micrograms per cubic meter at a short lag of zero to one days. <laughs> it's a very, very strange kind of conclusion about the clinical effects of evidence that they have found. If you look at the level of uh, data, the, content, uh, the PM 2.5 data compared to actually secret smoke, uh, you can see that it's at the bottom of the, the tail end there, so you just possibly would not be able to find any effects in that sense. This is now the real, real world picture. If you really think that uh, we are being exposed to very high level in the open air on the on the left-hand side of you, you can see in Shanghai City, it's at the level of, let's say, the day where 600 micrograms per meter cube. But then you can see the clear picture in that smoking booth. That is at the level you're being exposed at a level of 10,000 micrograms per cubic meter. Nobody is actually dropping dead in the, in the cigarette booth in that sense. This is another example I was able to find from South Korea, which is to try to quantify from basically they quantify 10 activities group from young people to old people, uh, and then also study them in different environment. The bottom line is essentially that we are more creature of, I guess, spacious earth. We live in our own uh, closed door environment. The main area in which that uh, if you are being exposed to, to the outdoor air is actually only 4% for all this group on average. Most of the exposure of uh, PM level is actually in a restaurant or bar, in Korea at least. Right, which is going on a level of about 200 micrograms per, uh, per, per meter cube. So it's also telling you that our lifestyles is another factor now in, in, in this game about how much we are being exposed to these particular matters. And now, as you can see, group like uh, this Health Defect Institute, HEI, is pushing, of course, more, more and more stringent uh, air quality standards, according to them that you have more and more effects that's being detected at very low level of PM and ozone in the US and Europe, 
which as you can see, it's, it's only weasel wording, but then you are not able to show for anything. And then they are talking about all these developing world standards that, that they have to deal with. The picture here is just simply to try to show you, I mainly wanted to show you how the impossible standard that is being imposed in, in India, for example. If you com compare the column of India on the, on the leftmost uh, column versus the USA, you can see that the India is a lot more stricter than USA. Right? It tells you that a lot of this uh, funding business in terms of uh, establishing the PM and ozone ambient standard. By the way, there is a new, new uh, uh, attempt by EPA to try to force the ozone eight hours limit to go from current standard of 75 ppb down to 60 to 70. This is really, really a very stupid thing to do, but uh, anyway, I, I think that most of us should try our best to try to, to show the, the evidence and reasoning for why this thing is completely crazy. Uh, we got to do something about this. It's just a terrible thing for them to, if they are allowed to do this. Now I want to take a complete different switch to tell you my goose chase on this very curious mystery of finding the ground surface ozone data during the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Okay, so if you think that you want to fix the air, try to follow this example and see how impossible it is in terms of what the level of understanding we have today. Before that, maybe I won't quote this, but uh, you have King Edward, the one which always already given some uh, ideas about why we should not pollute ourselves to death. And then King Edward continued the tradition to try to save the rest of the England, King Richard II, and finally Henry V, who proposed that uh, we should have a royal commission to study this issue. So this is the first step to ignoring all the basic issues, according to Professor Richard Wilson. I'm going to start with this stuff, that slide that I borrowed from Professor uh, Jim Jang from uh, University of Southern California. He is the key uh, scientist for studying what we call the Beijing Heart Study, which I'll show you. And, and of course, this is putting a very positive spin on, on improving air quality and health, right? So this is a true legacy of Beijing Olympics, according to him. As you, we all know, it's true that the air in Beijing is terrible. So you can have magazine in Chinese magazine that basically saying that people in China are crying while they are breathing, right? And so they need the, the official clean air for the Beijing Olympic and, you know, stuff like that. And this is a, a view of, uh, of uh, Tiananmen Square, which is actually right at the center of Beijing. If you measure the... Uh, this is just to point to you the map. The center region is basically all those full of dots and then it's basically high mountainous region on this uh, northwest transact here. And then there are a lot of industrial cities around the Beijing area. Uh, but if you measure everything from the center of Beijing, which is Tiananmen Square, outward, you have at least data like this. Uh, you know, it's all trending outwards as you go out from the city, except for very polluted city like Haber and Tianjin. Herpei and Tianjin, you have some very high pollution level. That is true. But here's what's happening in, in the Beijing Olympic. They got approved and awarded to be hosting the Olympics in uh, 21. So the Beijing Olympic Committee actually promised that they're going to make the air quality better during, during this Olympics period, right? at least compared to previous host city. So this is some statistics, the numbers. For the total cost of Beijing Olympic, it cost them about $43 billion with only about $2 billion spent in construction, but $9 billion of that is for air quality improvements. $9 billion. Please try to guess what the answer in terms of the air quality improvement, in terms of this wild goose chase on the, on the surface ozone later. So these are all the steps. You, know, you basically do it before the, the event, a week or a month before that, and then during the weeks, and then after the week, what they do in terms of not letting cars and cars moving around, shutting off a lot of these uh, factories and stuff like that around Beijing areas. So these are the, the implementation that they were trying to do. So they have another very interesting uh, mathematics, which is legislation plus technology, adding a little bit of the Beijing Olympics, so you get some clean air. It's very nice. Uh, obviously, some of it is true, of course. But again, the problem is half true that is contaminating the problem here. So you look around to look for the data of uh, Beijing uh, 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 Olympics, uh, during Beijing Olympics, the air pollutant. So you find paper like this, quantifying the air pollutants emission reduction during this period. So you've got a bunch of these people from Tsinghua University, which is one of the most prestigious universities in China. You can see that they started to quantify the emission level. 
Okay, they show you, oh, during the week before the month, uh, before the Beijing Olympic in June, and uh, during that world, the SO2 level is high, NOx level is high, according to all the different industrial activities, and all that stuff, and then during the Beijing Olympic week, this whole thing dropped down. I hope some of you catch already by this sort of plot. What does that mean? It actually means not much. Why don't you just go ahead and measure this thing instead of just quantifying and calculating this by using your fuzzy math? That's what I don't like about this stuff. Same thing, PM10.0 and then this non-methane VOC, volatile organic component. I'm going to show some of that later, so you need to know what VOC is. So this is the non-methane component. Equally, of course, if you shut it out, you can calculate this. Oh, it's going to drop. But the question for me is, and this is actually a measurement, PM2.5. Matt, give me some statistics. Is it dropping or is it going up? I don't know, man. But something like that. Okay, this is what the data shows. So you can tell me whether it's cost effective or not. For $9 billion, I guess uh, I don't quite like the data. But the worst stuff is actually is about this long chase of finding what the level of surface ground ozone is. I really spent a lot of time looking for this. And I was not able to find it. I, I, find, I find some of the, the point. So you find paper like this. They have a mobile laboratory trying to run around Beijing during Olympics to measure this stuff on road measurement in the inner city of Beijing. So they have equipment like this, very nice, can measure PM, can even measure, they mentioned that they will measure also ozone, okay, as you can see. So they will be driving this truck around during Beijing Olympic and do the measurements. Unfortunately, even a paper with that title, you please read it. I read it about 20 times to make sure I'm not uh, mistaken. So they are driving around this area, of course. You can show this map in, in, in terms of the, the city rings, you know, the, the highway around Beijing. And uh, still cannot find the ozone data. I've become very puzzled. What is going on here? How come they're not showing any, any surface ozone data? I'm very, very curious. Okay? So what's going on? So I keep looking. Finally, you found another paper. So uh, by the way, it's a lot of paper. This is only the cream de la cream. Of course, I, I read a lot more paper than that. So you got this paper that involved now Michael McElroy. If, for some of you who know the ozone history, he's one of those proponents on bromine uh, uh, destructing the, the, the ozone in, in the stratosphere. So he's a big political player, this man. And uh, well, you look at paper like this, ozone air quality during effectiveness of emission destruction. Sounded very good. You try to look for the data, all right? See whether they have any data show. Okay. The first thing they say, you read around, oh, the ozone will decrease and all that, how many percent, this and that. But it's largely about meteorology. But then they say the model predicts the emission restrictions such as those can affect the ozone far beyond that. And they show you nothing but the model output. These are not data, by the way. They show you, oh, yeah, around there, there's this deep blob of this red. You know, if you know the color, that's all you need to learn. That's all, and then it decreases. Still no ozone data. That really bothers me like hell. Excuse my language. Then, finally, I saw data. Thank Lord, there's some data here. Okay, they have ozone data now. Okay, they're showing some ozone data. July, August, and September. They put it in dot, and then they put all this line plot. Looks very interesting, but I still don't know what it means. The only problem is that, where does this data come from? This data turns out to be at a place called Mi Yun. I'll show you where Mi Yun is. The problem is this Mi Yun is not in the Beijing city. It's 100 kilometers northeast of it. Of course, it's considered some area of Beijing. You can name it anywhere you want. But I guess I don't know the, what does that mean. I don't know what you're studying. So this is just to show you the relative math of how far is uh, Mi Yun from the from, uh, city of Beijing at the center there. Mi Yun is north, north, uh, well, northeast of, uh, of, uh, of Beijing. It's a very interesting thing. Still no, no ozone data in the inner city. Okay, I'm going to show you the climax. We do, we do, well, I was able to find that right away. And then you show that Michael McElroy have another paper who, before the Beijing Olympic, they wrote this paper talking about data in 2006 of the summer, measuring the, the carbon monoxide and uh, ozone data. Well, they are able to find some relationship of ozone with clouds, actually. They were able to show that if you have high clouds, you reduce the photo, the, the radiation coming in, so reduce the photochemical reaction, so you produce less of the ozone, so the ozone level go low, so you have an inverse relationship. Uh, very interesting. I don't think I even trust them, but I'm just trying to tell you that this is the kind of stuff they are studying. They're not anything definitive, and there are many more factors involved, I'm quite sure. But it does take 16 very good medical doctors to screw the light bulb. Okay? I finally found it in this paper by Dr. You know, Jim Jang, 
from uh, USC. They are involved in this project. Okay, he's asking this basic question. I, I don't think there's any legacy of anything like that, but uh, they would insist. So this is the Beijing Heart Study, which I think is okay in terms of experiment. They wanted to design to see whether there's actual any effects that you can detect and stuff like that during the Beijing Olympic. After all, the government is spending a lot of money trying to control the air pollution by stopping all the industrial activity, isn't it? And they published a paper in JAMA and uh, with all this stuff, uh, claiming some very interesting association that they see the changes in air pollution and uh, all these biomarkers of inflammation and thrombosis, right, in healthy adults. That's fine. I think the result, some of the results may be valid. I, I don't know what to say about that. All I know is that they claim that they were able to find these effects, right? And these are, so therefore it leads to this sort of a simple statement, uh, you know, uh, drive less and give your heart a break. Okay, maybe I'll do that. <clears throat> this is the stuff that show you what they're planning to do. They have six hospital visit examination during, before, during, and after. And what they're actually measuring is a bunch of this stuff that, by the way, I'm not a medical scientist. I just wanted to show you that measure all kinds of stuff in terms of the people that visited the, the, the hospital. And then they're also trying to measure the air pollutant. This is the one that interests me. By the way, I was only interested in looking for the ozone data. So O3 there, there is O3 there, good. So blah, 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 they measure something. And here's the bottom line, the health effect, all the biomarkers, they were able to show that before the Olympics, it was at the level of this, and then they all went down, roughly. There's a little bit of go up, you know, if you put the real error bar, you won't be able to say that it's actually going up. So it's going down, mostly. And then after the Olympics, if you no more doing that, it's going up. Okay. That seems reasonable. I don't know what it means, but all I know is that, yes, what it is. But the question is, what is the ozone level? Okay? So is it true, is it true that uh, it's the old surface ozone that is causing these improved health effects that you observe? Actually, it turns out that it's not true. So the whole $9 billion pollution control for that is hidden in that one sentence there. In contrast, ozone concentration increased by 24% during that level. And this is the data. This is really a long chase. I finally found this and I was very proud of myself. <laughs> and I finally found solved this puzzle, actually. It's a very strange one. You know, sometimes, you know, you're f I'm free-minded. I want to see as much as I can. Obviously, now I understand why there's not much discussion of the ozone data. I don't know why they're not talking about ozone. And this is the result to show you basically what the measurement, everything go down except for the ozone level. The reason why I insist on showing you that and making you, you torture through all that is to try to tell you about the, the chemistry and all this stuff about the surface ozone. It's a lot more complicated than just simply controlling, let's say, the precursor of ozone. They call it NOx and SOx. You can take all many classes as much as you want to, to learn about all this. But the bottom line is that we still need to learn a whole lot more. I'll give you an example in a minute. But to show you that what they are doing, uh, this is another, another measurement okay, that they are doing. And this is basically the bottom line plot. If you plot what is available during the Beijing Olympics in the Beijing area and outside the Beijing surrounding area, you plot the PM 2.5 versus the ozone level, you can see that the data is all over the place. I hope that nobody is claiming that this is the real effects of more uh, pollutant. Uh, PM 2.5 will mean that there are more ozone level, right? I mean, the data, data is pretty hairy to me. <coughs> it shows you that there are all sorts of factors, especially meteorological factors that is controlling this stuff that really beyond human control in some sense, unless you believe that cutting, cutting CO2 can change everything. So what gives? This is the bottom line in that sense. I just no time to talk about this in details, but to give you an illustration of a, a paper that was published long ago, but it's related to study of basically the sources of a biogenic emission of a volatile organic component, VOC, from actual forest itself versus the industrial sources. The top two panels showing you the effects from the industrial SO2 and then the, the anthropogenic component of the VOC. The effects are really not as big as basically what is emitted from the forest. So it's affected very much the optical depth and basically the, the aerosol effect of, uh, uh, of the southeast United States during summer. This effect. So it, it clearly shows you that the natural factors is clearly overwhelming and, and one should really be more careful about studying the natural factors, which of course is a theme that I wanted to start researching, but unfortunately, officially, I'm not allowed to do any such thing. And then I give another example. This is about 
Atlanta Olympic. Can we see the effects in Atlanta Olympic in 1993? I'll blow the, the, the words up. The words up is that according to this study, they were able to find the ozone go down actually. It's very interesting. But they say they observed similar reduction in several other cities. Okay, I don't know what that means. And then they say now, but then when the surface ozone went down according to them, but they don't find no effects of this emergency visit. They will have no evidence of uh, reduced emergency visit, which means they couldn't find the beneficial visual effects. Just to put you in perspective in Atlanta, there's uh, all this region which I've never been to Atlanta, so I don't know what it is, but there are some locations that were measuring this ozone and the emergency visit uh, data. So they tell you that the ozone data is going down in site C and site E. Matt, I don't know whether you can really prove that to be going down or not, because the, bottom, the point is that the dash line is the baseline, and then during the Olympic, the solid line, supposedly during the Olympic period, those things are relatively lower. So at those two sites, according to them. And then this is the part where they show the emergency visit is not changing at all, right? So how can it be? When the surface ozone go down, but you have no beneficial health effect. So uh, the sponsor of that study, the Health Effects Institute, actually, by the way, based in Boston, uh, they actually had to comment, uh, uh, issue a critique of that study because, of course, after their own funding couldn't prove any of these things, they have to have a critique on talking about what's wrong with that instead of pointing out what's wrong with EPA study for, for pointing out these positive effects that this, this, the, this effects on PM harm, being harmful that is not actually being shown by anybody at all. So fixing the air, let's see. One more question to consider. Like I say, the whole truth is everything. I, in this showing this, I don't mean to actually imply that I believe in any of this result. I only want to tell you that there is a consequence too. Here's a very interesting twist in terms of reducing the PM2.5. By the way, the Chinese government are very active in terms of controlling the sulfur uh, output, so they're beginning to put a lot of these equipments into their power plant. This is a picture showing you that if you, if you actually decrease your PM outputs, you will actually will cause a reduce of the base, so-called base cation, right? from the PM control policy by 2020. What that shows is that reduce the deposition of base cation will increase the acidity of the soil, actually. So this is the effects, the, one of those unintended consequences, if you were to consider that. But of course, still we need to consider whether this effect is, is meaningful or not. But I'm trying to point to the, the whole issues about this micromanagement that we think we can manage about the, the, the world's environment until we, before we understand actually what the natural environment is doing. Here is another data set showing you that basically in, in, a, in a region of, a, in Belgium, the mountain, mountainous areas, I mean, the, all the cations are actually are decreasing over time already. Measured since, I think, about 1977, they have data like that. Again, we have stuff that is cities that is pretty much polluted these days. You have Londons that look like this in 19th century, and then there are times in which you may have something shiny. So what it is that basically we're dealing with? We're really dealing with the, the world are facing some kind of small problem, isn't it? Not specifically, I would say, PM 2.5 or any ground ozone problem per se, in that sense. And I'm very disturbed by some recent very romantic nonsense from uh, environmentalist group by, by not really, really wanting to tell the whole truth because the whole truth about the current U.S. situation is that our economy is suffering big time. I mean, they are talking about how the CO2 emission has been decreasing lately. But you know what? It has, it has not, it's having to do with our increased use of the natural gas. It's a very romantic idea because we have a lot more natural gas coming online. But the, the, the bottom line is that it has nothing to do with the use of natural gas, really, isn't it? If you, according to this new study, when you had the biggest drop from 2007 to 2009, the major drop of the CO2 emission, most of the drop is really related to economic factor, almost 83% of it. So it really has nothing to do with the increased use of the efficiency of the system or stuff like that. It's just the bottom line more economy progress or prosperity will lead to better environmental control. That's about it. And this is the bottom line picture, actually, that plot by EPA. I'm quite sure EPA will use this very differently from us. EPA is essentially trying to say that, well, it's possible for, for us to increase wealth, GDP, and more travel vehicle miles in the orange line, and, of course, increase productivity, and so on and so forth, until, of course, 2009, we started to go down a bit. And while your air pollution level has been going down for all the six common air pollutants. 
I rather say that the whole reason for this air pollutant going down is because that we have this uh, uh, good uh, uh, productivity, actually, right? It, it is this kind of uh, opposite sense that they are trying to introduce that bothers me quite a bit. Finally, in a Chinese way, they say that if you can get rid of all these pests and pestilence and you will be able to create wealth and prosperity for 10,000 generations. I'll just end with this simple quote. True things leads and untrue things mislead. So let's beware of what EPA is trying to do. Thank you. <laughs>